morning and welcome to Geopolitical Trends, where truth matters. Very, very excited to be with you. I have an interesting topic that uh, I was reading yesterday, some stuff. Usually that's what I do in the afternoon, read up on what's going on. And uh, to my surprise, because I was waiting to see if I could find any information regarding uh, uh, New Zealand. Why is this? It's because way back when I made a video back then, when Mahuta, back then the prime minister, I believe, when uh, she had the meeting with uh, Tony Blinken, was trying to push her into accepting uh, to being part of AUKUS, AUKUS, and she said at that time, no, we're not interested. And I said back then, it's on the record, I'll be waiting for a few months to see how this government's going to decide. Well, now it becomes clear that probably they're going to be sucked in into AUKUS. And this is what I'm going to be providing you with my insights and, and, and analysis about it. Because it was like predicted, per se, that New Zealand now steps up its interest into joining AUKUS. So, well, was it pressured? We will, we will discuss all this as we move forward. But uh, here are the questions, by the way, that we need to ask. And I have them for you. Let me share them with you on the screen here. Uh, because those are basic questions. One of them is, is this about security in Asia Pacific? Or is it about encircling China? And the third question is, will this reshape the geopolitical and security landscape in the region? Because those are legitimate questions to ask, given what's taking place right now in that part of the world. We're not talking about West Asia, Middle East. We're not talking about Africa. We're not talking about Latin America. We're talking about in that part of the world, Asia as a whole. So, and this is why it's worth asking those questions. But before I delve deeper into all this, let me say hi. And by the way, I do remember one name here, John Smith from New Zealand. Your... Uh, your uh, insights will be very, very important in this discussion, given you are from there. So, so this is what I want to I want to say just hi to all of you. Uh, uh, C. Slater, good to see you. Alan Tan, good to see you. Uh, Emerson Bangora, you become a channel member. Thank you for becoming a member and welcome to our community here. So Emerson, good to see you. Uh, John Black, good to see you. John Smith from New Zealand, right here. So New Zealand. Yes, I will be talking about uh, Mr. Callaway soon. Uh, Willie Holman, as always. Hamad Sidi, as always, from the UK. Hiri Lukel, here he is, one of our, uh, one of my support, avid supporters. Hiri's been there for since I started this. So, so good to see you, Hiri. Uh, Francis Tango, as always. Uh, Ron and Julie Holiday. You all remember this couple, guys. They are from, yeah, back away in New Zealand. So... So, this is good to see you. Ponya, too, good to see you. All right, let's get in into our conversation here. But before I'll dig deeper, I'm going to get into some headlines here because it's worth uh, addressing. And I'm going to start with the first one right here. Mr. Callaway, which, by the way, I did send him an email a few months ago uh, inviting him to the show. I haven't heard back from him. So I'm sure he's busy. I I'm, I, I don't take it personally, of course, but he's he just busy. So anyway, what happened with Mr. Callaway? Well, he's celebrating his victory in the parliamentary uh, election in Rochdale. Yeah. He won by, by about 40%, nearly 40% of the vote in the British parliament. Uh, and this is sort of, it's a big, big deal. Why? First of all, he's a seasoned... Uh, uh, politicians. He understands the ins and outs of how these things work. Uh, let me get you guys uh, open up the link for you here. Yeah, well, what's interesting about it is that what this election means for him and because he won after the British Labour leader, Keir Starmer, and this is what he said in his victory. This is Mr. Callaway. He said, and I quote, uh, he said, you will pay a heavy price for the role you played in enabling, encouraging, and covering up the catastrophe which is currently taking place in occupied Gaza and the Gaza Strip. End of quote. Yeah, he's straightforward. So 
So we're going to see some changes now to how far it's going to go. I don't know yet. So, But but it's very, very interesting to see him back in the political scene because he's a voice of reason. And and, and I like Mr. Callaway. He's a straight shooter. So I would love to one day to have a, an opportunity to have a conversation in an interview with him. So. Uh, second one I want to share with you, second headline is this one right here. You all know what this is, right, guys? <laughs> That's the ECOWAS. Uh, that's the Economic Community of West African State. And that's the Nigerian president who's, by the way, been playing both sides when he realized that, oh, I ain't going to go the way he wants it based on what the other countries, France and the West, are pressuring him. Now he's changing the tone. That's a double standard, in my opinion. Never trusted the guy. I have nothing against him. We all know Nigeria is a very rich country in, in natural resources, oil, and so forth. But it's marred by corruption to its core. And it's not just Nigeria. It's around the world. We have it right here in our own country. So to those some who argue that I kind of misrepresented the history about Africa when I talked last time, that's nonsense. Because I always tell you guys, when I do history, I only provide a brief snapshot. I'd have to spend hours and hours doing the history if I want to cover everything. So it was no need for these nasty comments because this is very stupid. You're allowed to express yourself as long as you make sense. So in any event, here is what happened with the ECOWAS now. Now, it looks like, in my opinion, and this is also based on the article that I read, that the countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, where the coups took place, and now imposing their will on ECOWAS, and rightly so. And I remember on the record that I said, I doubt it that ECOWAS will go and invade Niger. Why? Because you have Burkina Faso and Mali declared they will support Niger. You have even Algeria willing to send these troops. And it tells me right there back then when I reached my, we reached my conclusion that ECOWAS is just doing the talking on behalf of its masters. So now, what are they doing? Now, so after seven months of economic blockade, yeah, seven months, the freezing of bank accounts, the closing of borders, and the threat of a military intervention, ECOWAS now decided to calm down. Yeah, with the coup leaders in Niger. It tells you right there where the story is. So it wasn't about standing up for whatever. ECOWAS was, do, was doing the bidding for the West, mainly France. But now it's not working. So anyway, this is what I, that's all I have for as far as the headline. I just wanted to share this because I have to cover a lot on this topic of New Zealand. Uh, this is the Prime Minister uh, of New Zealand, but I need to uh share first of all uh, what this is all about well this is the idea that china has issued now a warning to new zealand over its interest meaning new zealand's interest in joining AUKUS. i found that very troubling why is this it is troubling because it is the same path now, listen carefully, guys. It is the same path that I'm seeing New Zealand now embarking on, the same one Australia did. And look where Australian economy is. And I'm going to tackle the trade between China and New Zealand to give you an idea. So, in other words, New Zealand now is shooting itself in the foot. Why? Because most likely it has been pressured by the U.S. through Australia. And this is what I'm going to dig deeper into in this conversation. And by the way, just prepare a question or two, uh, and I'll be happy to answer this for you. So, so uh, here is the thing. Now, the argument Australia has made is that, well, wait a minute. There is a security concerns. Now, they are growing in Asia and so forth. So New Zealand now is considering uh, joining the non-nuclear pillar of AUKUS, which doesn't make any sense. There are two main reasons. Uh, why it won't work? It's because AUKUS in itself is a nuclear pact. Look what we did to Australia by selling them $380 billion submarines. We forced it on them. So New Zealand won't be in a way to 
cherry pick what it wants, let alone it'll challenge what New Zealand stands for, that no nukes for New Zealand whatsoever. So it makes me wonder, are we going to see some sort of demonstrations in New Zealand where New Zealanders, or Kiwis that is, will stand up to their government because the government took uh, uh, took uh, took about face per se and started going this direction. It wasn't like this. And here is why. Australia went ahead and sent a delegation to New Zealand to brief them. That's the key word. Brief them on the alliance, I mean, in AUKUS, that is, which is between uh, US, UK, and Australia. After a meeting in Melbourne. So because they want to hash out. And the talks of this conversation or these negotiations or meetings, whatever term you want to use, we're focused mainly on approaches to, even though the hiding behind foreign policy, security, and defense in the Asia Pacific, it has nothing to do with that. It's nonsense. It has to do with sucking in New Zealand into AUKUS the same way the US and UK did for Australia by now pushing, because it's a done deal as far as the nuclear submarines. That is what's at the heart of it. This is why I asked the question, is this about really security in Asia Pacific or is it about encircling China? So, And here is where it concerns me the most is that New Zealand's understand where China stands on this. And New Zealand also understand how much trade it does with China. And despite the concern that China has expressed, New Zealand is potentially damaging its relationship uh, with China by joining AUKUS. That's the way I see it. So, And the thing is that historically, and I'm going to tackle some of this, historically New Zealand has always had a good, if I may use the term, uh, conciliatory uh, sort of approach towards China because the economy. And that is why I'm like way back when I talked about this uh, some few months ago, uh, Mahota, when she said no, because they were pushing into that direction. They want to stay neutral. And I said back then, we're going to have to wait a few months to see if they're going to be pressured. And here it is because the change in the new government. Uh, when uh, uh, Hawthorne's, I believe his name, uh, when he took over, he took, he just flipped. Well, they flipped him, basically. <laughs> that's uh, that's how they did. So, But before I move forward, I'm going to talk about a little bit of geography for Australia, for, I'm sorry, New Zealand, and the historical aspect, because there are some things you need to know. So let me open up the link to World Atlas, because that's where I'll uh, uh, share my maps with you. And I give credit to uh, World Atlas for that one. So, all right, let me share the screen with you. Uh, New Zealand, right there. Okay, let me close this one here. Here we go. And uh, let me make this screen. Okay, it's there we go. Let me make the screen folder here so you can see. So geography of New Zealand. Well, New Zealand, as you know, is an island country. So, and one of many, many other islands that make up Oceania. That's how it is known uh, in, in, a uh, in a geography or jargon that is. So it is located in the South Pacific Ocean to the southeast of Australia, south of New Caledonia, Fiji, and Tonga Islands. New Zealand is geographically positioned both in the southern and eastern hemispheres of the earth. The island country is completely surrounded rather, by the Pacific Ocean. New Zealand shares maritime borders with Australia, Tonga, Fiji, and the other island countries in Oceania. That is what's important. Now, the history of it is also as important as you might even think, you know. And here is why it is important. Because the human history, when it comes down to New Zealand, it can be dated back between 1320 and 1350. Common era, CE that is. 
when the main settlement period started after it. So it was discovered and settled by Polynesians who developed a distinct Maori culture. That is what, uh, what's important about this one. There is a, a great article, which I'm going to post for you guys. It was written by uh, uh, Thalita Alves. And I digged back and I found this article was published in 2018. And I found some stuff in it very, 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 very important. So, so I'm going to share it with you. And it confirms the date that I disclosed to you uh, as far as the, uh, the first uh, set of East Polynesian migrants were around the 1250 through 1300 AD. Well, well, before European colonizers set, <clears throat> excuse me, set sights onto this stretch of the Pacific. So, well, it is fair to say that the first arrivals uh, to New Zealand indigenous Maori people are said to have arrived from the East Polynesian region known as the Hawaii. I hope I pronounced it correctly. But there is some kind of challenge to that because historians and archaeologists believe that the country's original migrants came from several locations. And this was based on a DNA evidence that indicates that the first round of settlers arrived from places like Society Island and Cook Islands. So, so in Maori tradition, Kupa or Kup was the first navigator to reach New Zealand's shores. And tribal narratives tells that after several challenges, battles, and memorable feats, Kupe successfully managed to fend off his enemies to cross the Cook Strait and arrive to the North Island uh, uh, at that time. So, and there are some pictures I'm going to. Uh, share them with you, but there is one particular thing I need to share with you, and this has to do with the European arrival into the islands, because it's very important to understand. So now, there was a treaty at that time. Uh, uh, the treaty uh, was called Waitangi, which is a highly contentious document. That is still carries a lot of weight in today's time or today's politics. And briefly, what is it? It is a treaty between the both, the English or the British, that is, and the Maori. Because two versions, the British or the English and the Maori versions, stipulated different things. And here's the difference. In the British version, it mandated that the crown would always have full control over New Zealand territories. However, the Maori version indicated that the Maori will have full sovereignty over their tribal lands. And these deviations in interpretation led to a series of conflict collectively known as the New Zealand Wars, forceful Land grabs by the British also inspired one of the world's very first example of peaceful resistance. That's what I found very, very interesting. And I have the link to that, uh, uh, this article, and I'm going to share it with you guys in, uh, uh, in, in the description. I'll put the link for you uh, for that one. Now, there is another aspect that I need you to understand about the history of New Zealand also. And I, I had a link uh, for that one. Let me get to that link quickly here and see if if, if not, I'll, uh, I usually archives all this stuff for me and I'll, I'll, I'll provide it for you later on. So. Uh, yeah, the ones about British. Well, the British, uh, way back in 1830s, so... And those were the Christian mis uh, uh, missionaries who had now been working in New Zealand for nearly 20 years. This is part of how they pressured the, uh, uh, the Britain colonial office to take action. But colonization was an expensive business and London was not convinced of its necessity. New Zealand was not a sovereign state 
with centralized government. So making formal arrangement with Maori was very difficult. And here is the reason why you need to understand that, because you're going to have to look at the structure of the government in New Zealand. And I do have, uh, I did find some information that I'm going to be sharing with you. Let me get to it quickly here, because I did put one particular link to it uh, as to how the government in New Zealand works. And, and to me, it's troubling, because here is the thing. One thing you need to understand about the government and the society which is the almost talking about the constitutional framework for New Zealand. Well, New Zealand has a parliamentary form of government, the same way as England does, based on the British model. So, of course, in Britain, they have the upper house, lower house, or they call it the House of Lords, the House of Commons. For us, we have the same here in the US, except we call it the Senate and the House of Representatives. So in New Zealand, is the same model. And legislative power is vested in the single chamber house of representatives called the parliament that is the members of which are elected for three-year term so the political party or the coalition of parties that commands the majority in the house forms the government generally the leader of the uh, of the governing party becomes the prime minister Athens was like the party leader. He became the prime minister. So with ministers responsible for different aspects of the government form a cabinet. That's how they form their cabinet. So, so the cabinet, the way you need to understand it, is a centralized organ when it comes down to the executive power. And most legislation is initiated in the House on the basis of a decision made by the cabinet. And the parliament must then pass it by the majority. So now all this is great and all that stuff. The most concern for me personally as an observer, as an outsider, is that the British monarch still today the formal head of state and is represented by the governor general appointed by the monarch on the recommendation of the New Zealand government to a five-year term. What does it all mean in a simple language? It means that New Zealand is still under the authority of Britain, the same way Canada is, the same way of central countries in Central America, like the Bahamas Islands and, and Jamaica now is working on some stuff and all that. Australia also. So this is to me the uh, problematics. So of course, it's their country. They can decide whatever they want. Uh, so the governor general has limited authority with the office retaining some residual powers to protect the constitution. It's not about protecting the constitution. It's protecting the, we the, 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 the wealth of the monarchy. I ain't about to there. You and I know how it is. That's not, to me, that's just a, so I found it very, very interesting. And I'm going to share this link with you uh, uh, in the description. So. All right, let me get in into the analysis about really what's going on into all this. And by the way, I read an article uh, that was written by Eva Corlett. And Eva Corlett, this article was written, was published in Melbourne, in Australia. So, so I like to read from different sources, uh, not just from here in the US, which I usually don't read much here. Uh, uh, the Western media also, I don't buy too much into it, but sometimes... You, got, you can read, and for me, I read and I form my own conclusion. So, so I like to give credit to Eva Corlett because that's part of what I'm going to be uh, challenging some of the assumptions uh, uh, she wrote about. So, as I mentioned earlier, Australia is about to send delegation to New Zealand. Why? To explain to them about the second pillar of AUKUS alliance. Because the second pillar involves what does this, does anybody know you guys know two pillars right the first and second what does the second pillar of AUKUS involved in if you can type in in the chat box uh, i like to know uh, uh, your input into this one here what does it involve oh jo joseph oh joseph roy you wrote, thank you again for your time and input. You're most welcome, man. Truly appreciate it. And thank you so much for your super sticker. 
I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful. And and I like to do this because it truly really, I feel it's my duty to do so. All the knowledge that I acquired, that's time to share it with you all. So as I always say, guys, I decided not to teach at the university because I believe in this and that's what I'm doing. So your support means a lot to me. And I am very grateful to all of you. So thank you so much, Joseph. I appreciate it. Uh, oh, tar Taro Man Harris. Tar Taro Man has been an, an avid supporter. He follows me a lot on Twitter also and also on Locals. Thank you so much, Taro Man. Truly appreciate it. Uh, and, and I'm very, very grateful. Much appreciated. All right, let me see your answers, guys. The uh, five eyes. I'm going to talk about five eyes later. Spine, no. No, 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 no. The second pillar of uh, of August deals one with one specific aspect, which or oh, which New Zealand, by the way, doesn't want, doesn't believe in that. This is why the possibility of demonstrations in New Zealand could erupt if the if the government decide to go that route. Uh, all right, let me see if any will mention something about that one. For money. Uh, okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. It has to do with the nuclear aspects of it. Oh, you got it, Boyan Tzu. You got it. You got it. It has to do with the nukes. And he, what is the constitution in New Zealand says? They want a free nuke area in their country at least. So now they're gonna be changing, assuming they agree to that one. So. Uh, let me say thank you to Alan Sin again, an avid supporter from my neighbor to the north in Canada. Thank you so much, Alan Sin. Greatly appreciate your support. So then the nuclear aspect of it, and this is why I argued back then when Mahuta challenged uh, Tony Blanken at that time by saying, no, we are not interested in, 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 uh, in, in joining the AUKUS because it was this particular aspect. That means if New Zealand agreed to AUKUS, that means it will be now be bound by the rules of what AUKUS. And who's in AUKUS? Only US, UK, and Australia. Well, if you think about who really in AUKUS, it's just the US. And the US dictating the terms because both New Zealand and Australia are under the monarchy in the UK. That is where I am seeing where this all this. Of course, New Zealand is going to make the argument. You're right, Joseph. You wrote defense or AUKUS. You're right. They're going to make the argument this is about uh, collective defense security in the Asia Pacific. Nonsense. Nonsense. And, and you will know why as I move forward in my uh, discussion here. So. so the idea that New Zealand now stepping up, it's interesting joining the non-nuclear power of AUKUS. I don't see that happening because nuclear power is part of what AUKUS is going to be about. That is the reason why they end up uh, uh, selling New, uh, Australia the nuclear submarine, Virginia class, which, by the way, even New Zealand now is going to be moving into upgrading its military. Well, the technology, especially when it comes down to the nuclear stuff, ain't going to be shared with them. We will be the one controlling that. That's how it works. And to my surprise, Australia and New Zealand is like, what are they risking their economic prosperity to serve the US and UK and Australia? The AUKUS for that matter. So, and all this, based on the article, this is why I'm challenging Eva Corlett on this, because it says that all this aimed at China's growing presence in the Pacific. Well, hold on a second. Who's growing its presence in, in, in the Pacific? Look what we, the United States, have in Philippines. Look what we have in South Korea. Look what we have in Japan. Look what we have and are going to have in Australia with our naval base in Perth. This is where the submarine is going to be uh, uh, based. And you look at, of course, what are we doing in Taiwan? Then you look at what we're doing in some islands. So, And this is why 
the New Zealand foreign minister, I have a picture of him, Peters, I believe his name, right? This guy here. Uh, uh, yeah, Winston Peters, who's, by the way, also the deputy prime minister, you know. So he and the defense minister, her name is Judith Collins, the one standing by his side, they traveled to Melbourne. They went to Melbourne to meet with their counterparts in Australia, Penny Wong and Richard Marles. Penny Wong is the foreign minister. Richard Marles is the defense secretary uh, of Australia. And all of them, you can just see where the narrative is going. Because now we see what's going on with Australian economy. I'm not talking defense. I'm not talking anything. I'm talking about the economy. And I remember last time I had a conversation with Robbie uh, 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 Barwick. You know, he's someone I trust. He's there. And he disclosed to us where the economy is going. The same thing I foresee now coming to, uh, to New Zealand if they move forward uh, uh, into that direction. Of course, the conversation between those two countries, New Zealand and, and, and Australia, all centered around the same narrative that we've been saying, security, foreign policy, and defense, especially in the Asia-Pacific region. And that's the same argument that, what's his name, Albo made when he met with his counterpart, when, when he met with President Xi back then. And even back then, they were prominent Australians that are urging Albo uh, to sort of adopt some activist middle power role to head off a war between the U.S. and China. They are not in position to do so. Australia is not a... They are not in position to play that honest broker. They can't. Australia surrendered its sovereignty to the U.S., Australia is under the rule of the monarchy in Britain. How can they play an honest broker to avoid the war between US and China? It's just nonsense. But this nonsense is what the media is feeding the masses because the arguments, that's how it goes. So, so and if you only listen to, or I'm going to share with you what, uh, let me see if I can find the picture. Uh, I'm sorry, not this one. No, I don't have the one specific picture here that I found. Uh, and a joint press conference. You have the Australian uh, you have the Australian defense minister, okay? When he mentioned about the delegation going to New Zealand very shortly to brief New Zealanders about the second pillar of the AUKUS, pa uh, AUKUS pact, you know, his argument, and by the way, the, uh, the second uh, uh, pillar of AUKUS covers the sharing of advanced military technologies, including quantum computing and artificial intelligence. Well, let me ask you a question. <laughs> this is a question for you. Who is ahead in the computing or quantum computing in the world? Can anybody type in in the chat box? Who is the country that is taking the lead? made the strides into quantum computing. And I read up on that and I saw the data of it. I don't, I, uh, uh, I mean, quantum computing is not my area, but I was uh, able to at least read up and confirm the information or the results that was announced by this country. Let me see which country you guys type in. Uh, Alan C, you're absolutely correct. Kevin James, you absolutely correct. You guys got it. Uh, Celestine, the sky, Iran, no, 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 you meant China, 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 uh, that is one uh, that is uh, having a stride into the quantum computing because they advanced so, 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 so far, so fast and so far, we're just playing catch up. So, so when they said about this, uh, the argument that Australia is making, by the way, Australia is making the argument on behalf of the United States. We didn't want to say it. We're pushing Australia to the front to, to do our bidding for that. So, and this is why that security pact between, uh, uh, between Australia, the UK, and the US, and this is what now prompts China to really think in terms of 
maybe we need to change our strategy. So they're going to approach it in a very, very diplomatic manner with, with New Zealand. Give them a chance. And if they don't, China has some options at its disposal. They really can shut down the economy of New Zealand. And I'm going to share with you as to why. So, so anytime they said about this nuclear technology sharing, whatever, I ain't going to be any. Now, there is one key that New Zealand's going to be playing into this. And what is that one? This one has to do with, uh, let me share a picture. Uh, where are my pictures? That has to do with this one here. What are you looking at? You're looking at, at the Five Eyes Alliance. Okay? Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into it. Suffice it to say that the alliance sort of uh, think about it as a global intelligence. is a web. Because there are more than five. Okay? Does anybody know how many are there? There are more than five. But the five are the main ones. So, which is a, a, a covered club uh, that continued to redefine geopolitical landscapes. And those are the five English speaking countries. That includes, of course, and let me share another picture with you. That includes those countries here uh, Canada, US, UK, Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, that's what they are. So. And what is the purpose of it? Oh, is that establishing some sort of uh, a surveillance and information sharing that continues to shape the world approach to national security? Uh, ain't about that. You know, that's just one area. But uh, it is what I wanted to share with you uh, as information that some of you might not know. Uh, there are five eyes, but there are also the nine eyes and they are the 14 eyes yeah don't be surprised uh, only it's known the five eyes because those are the main one in other words the other countries that are part of the nine eyes and the 14 eyes 14 including the five those are just like some subordinate they report their information to the main five eyes which mean basically the us and uk that's that's about it. That's how it is. So, so let me share with you uh, uh, the other uh, countries that involves into the uh, five. As we say, there are five. The main one: New Zealand, Australia, Canada, UK, and the US. Then there's the nine eyes. Well, the nine eyes alliance includes the five eyes in addition to four other countries. And the four other countries are Denmark, France, the Netherlands, and Norway. Those are now the nine eyes. Then there is the 14 eyes. In addition to this, you add other countries. That includes Germany, Belgium, Italy, Spain, and Sweden. With all of them, there are 14. But we always refer to this as the five eyes because those are the main countries uh, involving into all this one. Here. So, now... There is one thing I need you to understand, which wasn't disclosed. I can even put the link for you guys. I am sorry, I won't, because I did it one time in one of the videos, and YouTube sent me an email. We, they took it down without even my consent. So I'm going to just share the information with you, uh, but I am not going to put the link uh, out there. But it's not about the link and all that stuff. It's about the content of the information. Well, here is what's important for you guys to understand. It was New Zealand itself that lobbied France. Yeah, regarding the Solomon Island China Pact. You all remember Solomon Island won into an agreement with China. We didn't like it. We pushed PNG, Papua New Guinea. But France, because it has some territories there from way back. We all know what France did in, 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 in that part of the world. New Zealand went ahead and lobbied France for that. And this, by the way, was revealed through some cables. Cables, this is like the communication within state departments, intelligence agencies, and so forth. So, so what happened is that New Zealand lobbied France territories in the Pacific to respond to a news of a controversial security pact between China and Solomon Island 
that sets off. This is what they're saying. Oh my gosh, it's setting off the alarms in Western capitals. Well, how about the U.S. doing a, a security pact with Australia? How about the U.S. signing a security pact with South uh, Korea or Japan or Philippines? You know, it just... Uh, and what happened, guys, is within days after uh, this uh, sort of uh, 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 cables went out, the information was leaked. Remember, this happened a year and a half ago or so. It wasn't disclosed much. But it was during the same time when China made the deal with Solomon. This is why in the Maldives, what was the first order of business? For Maldives, is asked India to get out. Because Maldives didn't trust India because India was doing the bidding for the U.S. behind the scenes. Even though uh, 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 India is not part of AUKUS, but it is part of Quad. And this is why New Zealand reached out to France uh, to do this. So, so you look at it, representatives of New Zealand, uh, Australia and France, they met to discuss these implications for the region. Why the heck is France involved in this? Look where France is. They got enough issues in their own economy. What are they worrying about Asia? Same thing for us. What are we worrying about Asia when we have our crumbling infrastructure is falling before our eyes, when our debt, national debt is skyrocketing? Uh, Americans have no idea what lies ahead, financially speaking. We have nothing to back this debt for. So this is what I'm saying. Why all of a sudden France is, 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 is involved into all this? Well, even though uh, the information, which, by the way, I'm going to share one picture with you. Uh, the information had some redacted information in it, meaning it can be disclosed. The cable suggests that New Zealand hoped that officials in French Polynesia which means the one that are serving in Polynesia on behalf of France. So, including the new Caledonia, okay, will take possession on the China Solomon Island Agreement. It just shows you right there. And let me share, see if I can find. Yeah, I, I do find it. Let me see if I can show it, if it will work. Let's hope it does. Yeah, right there. I know you can see it, guys. It's written small, but that's how how, how magnified I can make it. So it's not that. Uh, it just it shows you that was uh, that was the idea of where this particular documents. Uh, and if you notice the date of it, right there on March twenty second, and this uh, that's the cable that was sent. So I wanted to just share this with you uh, for you to be aware of this one here. So. And this is why, because China struck a deal with Solomon Island, all of a sudden, you get now New Zealand pulled into this aspect of, uh, and this is exactly what uh, Peters, he's the, where is his picture? Right here, the defense uh, uh, minister uh, the, and the deputy, the, the deputy prime minister and defense not defense, the deputy prime minister, what he said, and I quote, China is a country that practices something I have got a lot of time for. They practice their national interest, and that's what we are doing, end of quote. Well, that's two different stories here, mister. You know, uh, China, of course, didn't hold back. They responded through their its embassy in uh, Wellington by issuing a statement saying, and I quote, like all peace-loving countries, China has serious concerns over AUKUS. So in other words, end of quote, in other words, China is giving an opportunity for New Zealand to really think hard about this decision. The statement continues, and I quote, it is hoped that relevant countries will cherish, this is the Chinese statement, will cherish the hard-worn environments for peace and stability in the Asia-Pacific region and be prudent with their words and action, end of quote. It's spot on. But 
do you think those countries i mean australia is gone and new zealand now i'm i'm like becoming convinced that it's gonna go that route and this is where the issue is uh uh and and even china made it clear when they stated and i quote whatever role new zealand is being solicited to play in joining AUKUS, it will no doubt cast a shadow on bilateral ties and even offset what has been achieved in advancing bilateral cooperation end of quote what is the message of china in this statement is they are sending a, a strong message there to new zealand that you truly do not want to ruin your economy and here is why because i am going to share with you uh, something about uh, new zealand and australia and i'm sorry and china regarding trade uh, so china listen carefully guys china is new zealand's largest trading partner in goods and services you know and second largest overall including trade in services since new zealand china free trade agreement which was signed in 2008 two-way trade has increased from 10 billion dollar new zealand to 30 billion dollar new zealand bilateral economic and trade cooperation has expanded from trade in goods to trades in services investments scientific and technological cooperation digital economy a green economy and other fields this is what the message of china to new zealand is do you really want it to risk all this and that's basically because uh, uh new zealand major goods exports include the dairy product the meat product the wood product and uh, sort of uh, uh, some starch and flowers and all that stuff. Now, the services export includes tourism, education, transportation, and service, financial services. Now, what does New Zealand import from China? The key aspect up to almost, uh, and, and listen to this, New Zealand import from China are about $16.2 billion, comprising... 15.4 billion dollars in goods and 800 million dollars almost a billion in services so new zealand depends a lot on china when it comes down to electronics machinery clothing and furniture so and this is why i see that new zealand is really running the risk by accepting what the United States and Australia is pressuring it uh, for. So this is why now you see in the argument in Australia and in New Zealand, I'm sorry, that we need to sort of uh, uh, boost our military spending. And the justification is because Pacific power struggle is intensified. So I, I, I just... Uh, I don't quite get it, but again, I can only understand that the pressure that's been mounted on New Zealand, it is exactly why we are witnessing what we are witnessing when it comes down to New Zealand. So even as I said last time, a few months ago, when I did the, uh, even this guy, uh, Hipkins, when he was in power, you know, he wanted to approach china but he was redirected <laughs> that's to me becomes problematic when those leaders cannot take stand uh, i'm like you know are you that weak you couldn't say no when it matters i i don't quite get it i don't understand so but anyway this is where i see it going as far as uh uh, uh why australia is sending its delegation to new zealand is because they want to push new zealand into accepting the the second pillar of uh, uh, of AUKUS, which deal with the nuclear aspect which means what australia uh, new zealand will have to ratify its constitution to allow nuclear if they do that i don't know what the new zealanders is going to do so uh, demonstrations i don't know uh, john smith you're in new zealand if you would like to share your uh, opinion as to what your uh, 
uh, country will do, whether they will go up into some demonstrations regarding this. So, but yeah, here it is. You wrote it down, John. Protest. So most likely uh, New Zealanders will do that because that's been their policy. I've been aware of it, that they don't want any nucleus. They don't. You hardly ever used to hear about New Zealand. Why? They mind their own business. They're living in peace quietly. Yes, they are part of the five eyes and all that, but that's where it ends. But now things are changing and makes you just wonder. And I believe if they proceed forward, they're going to be experiencing the same fate as Australia, economically speaking. Uh, and there is some hard truth about how really uh, uh, devastated the Australian economy is. You know, ask any Aussies. And I do get some uh, 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 communication from inside Australia, not through here, through some other mediums. And those people that I trust and I know, I've been, I known them for a while now. Uh, they ain't going to be just telling me stories, you know. And I do check my, I know where to check my stuff. And they're telling me that things are getting so bad in Australia. And if you go back a few, few months, few a year and a half or two, all started when Australia took this hawkish stand against China unjustly. Unjustly. Why? Because we were pressuring Australia. And again, that's where it tells you where a country does not have a sovereignty. When a country like what you see now in Europe with Germany, with France, with Italy, Spain, you name it. You got the idea. Sweden, Finland, Denmark, all of them. The whole euro for that matter. Even now I'm starting to question about Hungary. I thought that Hungary will take stand. And if you want to get off of the EU, get out of it. But again, it's their decision. All I'm saying is, is, is when leadership is tested in situations like this, that's when it matters. So. Yeah, you're going to have some hardships economically at the beginning, but it's not the end of it because you do have some other options. There are options out there. And you think about all this. Is all this has to do with China? Maybe not. What about ASEAN? What about the economy of ASEAN where it's going as far as its growth? Could it be that this is pushed by the EU and NATO and all that stuff because they want to maintain that dominance? There is a possibility to that. One thing is sure, it's a, it is the geopolitical landscape is shifting. The world is changing and we need to change with it. That era of dominance, that era of dictating the terms, of, it's over. Some of us in Washington are living in denial. The world has already shifted. It changed. So now what it's going to become is, uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's it's. I've seen it now with how quickly things turned upside down for Australia. I've seen quickly how things are turning now upside down for Philippines. It's already turned over for South Korea. I'm sure you heard about the demonstrations of the doctors trainees in Australia that are in uh, in South Korea that are protesting. All this in Japan, all, all this is an indication of now when the major powers going down, it has to drag with it others. And that's problematic. And this is where I see the, the big mistake, the big mistake New Zealand is making strategically here. You know, I'm not talking about next month. I'm not talking about next year. I'm talking about the next 10, 15, 20 years. Like I said, the world has already shifted. The global geopolitical landscape has already shifted. Now it's going to become the direction where is the new trajectory that is going to go. And New Zealand will have to decide which direction he wants to go. I'm not saying that they should cut off their ties with the US or Australia or China. No, 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 no. It's just a matter of understanding how to balance that out. But... To take yourself into uh, or, or to dig your own grave, that just doesn't make sense to me, politically speaking. So, so this is where I see uh, the problem uh, uh, moving forward. Oh, well, let me see this one here. Nuruddin Musa, you're doing an excellent job, Doc. Thank you very much. Truly appreciate it. So, all right, guys, let me take a question or two. Before I'll do this, I made the decision that I am going to have the community live stream tonight 
at 1900 hours so that was because i promised you uh the decision will be made by noon and this is when i'm gonna be doing that one it's already posted and i can uh i don't know what it is i can share it with you uh, and again remember it's gonna be just a, a conversation no geopolitics so uh just i'm i'm gonna be preparing some some ideas to share with you on all that this afternoon and organize all this and when we just go from there and let me show you share with you rather the link to that live then uh we'll do it tonight at 1900 hours so here is the link i'm gonna put it in the in the chat box here for you guys that's for those but it's already posted so i will be doing that one at 1900 hours so uh also i want to extend my sincere thanks and appreciation to those who've been supporting the channel uh tc kwan just just bought me coffees in both locations for both the first one is for the channel uh, support for the channel the second one is for my asia trip uh, ac kwan drag 88 uh, osiris that is and and many others that have uh, bought me tea and coffee and uh, there are also some who did uh, uh, PayPal. Uh, let me see the last person here uh, that was donated to PayPal. Uh, Dong Me too, uh, but uh, sort of supported the channel through PayPal. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to all of you guys. And if you feel comfortable enough to support the channel here, those are the links where you can share uh, uh your support should you decide to do so and i'm very thankful all right let me see your uh, answer or your question rather uh let me put the link to paypal also and uh, i'm gonna go ahead and take one question or two from uh if you can just please put q so i know it's a it's a question and just go from there All right, and once again, thank you to those who uh, got me a, a super sticker. I'm, I'm very, very grateful. Uh, okay, uh, Athene Wu, I do see one here. David, what else can New Zealand do? As we know, all the so-called allies of the US are only US colonies in reality. US is not only world hegemony in name, it is, is not only it has strong control over the allies. That is true. Uh, the control stems from the idea of having the ability for us to dictate who we need to have in power and who, which to me is problematic. Who are we to dictate to this country? They can choose whomever they want. Even the system, they can choose whatever they want. But yeah, New Zealand, when well, New Zealand is small, you know, it's not a very, very influential country per se, uh, playing the five eyes is part of just keeping it in the club per se. But even the five eyes, it's only the US and UK that matter in all this. Canada, it's it's another useless. Uh, Australia, it's New Zealand is the same. So so yeah, the US is the, is the control of the military presence in those countries. But again, the governments are allowing this one. So what New Zealand can do? Well, they can take stand if that is what they want. But to do that, turn it over to the people and, and ask what the people want. To me, that's what a, a referendum in a democracy is. We don't even have that here in our own country. So do a referendum and let people decide what they want. That's the way I see it. Uh, uh fight back i i quite don't understand this question i only see wars which way are you looking doctor uh i'm i'm, I'm another i'm not the question is not clear to me so i don't want to assume that i understood it uh, if you can reword it that would be great and i'll be happy to uh, take a look at it so all right let me see uh army with harmony another avid supporter of the channel thank you so much uh question dr o in your opinion if congress and biden stopped sending funding weapons would the u.s economy improve is it too late uh no no it's not too late 
because you have to have a fiscal discipline. We are not fiscally disciplined into all this. Because if you stop the sending the funding, which means you're going to have to cut down the defense spending. Cutting down the defense spending will allow you to allocate more, uh, more funds for others, uh, other projects or other whatever. But you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to pay off your debt. I mean, $34 trillion in debt. That has to be paid off one way or another. Uh, I have one link here. I'll show it to you. Uh, uh, Fat Fingers shared it with me on my Twitter feed. Uh, and, and it shows you just the sizable uh, spending for our country. And, and uh, we'll give you an idea. So, hey, take a look, guys. I'm going to share this picture with you here. Yeah, look at that. So when you look at this, you look at for the U.S. is $860 billion and the rest of the other countries, you know, we not even come close. None of them even close to 100, except now China is moving into that direction. And that's about it. I mean, what for? Why are we having all this for? So, yeah, if we start with that one, that could change the equation for us as far as uh, uh, dealing with our national debts. But I don't see our Congress, uh, our system is, is, is done for. Let me just say it's straightforward. So, All right, one more question. I'll take a question from Joseph Roy. One last question here. Question, many believe that if there is an issue with BRICS, it will be India. I have a feeling that Iran may possibly be attempting to pull the wool over Russia's eyes. What is your thoughts? Uh, I concur with the first part, but the second part, I have to understand exactly what are you referring to. If Iran may possibly be attempting to pull the wool over Russia's eyes, uh, for what? That will be the key. If I know exactly uh, which area you are thinking about, then I will be able to answer that one, given that I wrote uh, books on each country. So I kind of very familiar with their uh, political thinking and strategic thinking that is regarding the dynamics. But the first part, I do agree with you. It's because there is that issue of, of India that needs to decide. Here is India in BRICS, but also India in quads. I understand about strategic interest. I understand all this. But at some point, this is the one what New Zealand now is finding itself at the thick of it. We know Australia is gone. We know New, uh, uh, South Korea is gone. Japan is gone. Uh, uh, Philippines is gone. Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Denmark, Sweden, Finland. You got the idea. Those countries are gone. You know. But it becomes a country like New Zealand now. While it's still time to make a decision. Because if I am to compare this to Germany now, Germany, it's too late for Germany. Germany's economy is sinking. They're going to go into recession. Mark my word on it. They might not even announce it. But I, I have family lives in Germany. I talk to people in Germany. So the economy is shutting down by design because we pushed it. Same thing I see for uh, uh, New Zealand. As to Iran pulling over uh, for, for Russia, I don't see that because there is a strong cooperation between Russia and Iran, especially now militarily. So I don't see what would be the objective of Iran to do so. All right, guys, I hope you find this very informative, and I look forward to seeing you at 1900 hours tonight for our community conversation. Uh, at the same time, I'm grateful for your support, and I appreciate your, your sort of uh, dedication if I may use the term, because uh, there's some avid supporters of you, and I'm very grateful for that. Please make sure to hit the like button and share this video with others so we can raise awareness that is around the world. As always, remember, geopolitics impacted daily life in more ways than one. Till next time, guys. Bye-bye.